Star writers take poetic license a lot. One of the biggest ball of lightning hits in 1981 is about a girl who everybody wants, including the singer. With the most famous number in recorded history, every 80s kid knows it by heart. Thousands of people were calling this number and rumors and urban legends have been rampant since then. But up next, both the lead singer and the lead guitarist co-writer dropped the real story of this classic song. I'm Professor of Rock, brought to you by Zenny Iwer. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to hit the subscribe button first below to be a part of a community that's dedicated to the timeless music of the rock era. Look us up on Patreon as well to be a part of curating this rock era. I've never liked the term one hit wonder because I feel like that it doesn't give the proper respect to the artist or song because a lot of times these one hit wonders, these songs are touchstones of our lives. You know, sometimes they have a longer life than multiple hit songs by other acts. So on here, we celebrate these single hits and call them bottle lightning when music and culture combine to make history. In 1981, MTV had launched. Uh, the second British invasion was taken over the radio airwaves. And a hardworking band from San Francisco went from playing bars and dives all the way to number four on the Hot 100 and number one on the rock charts. Tommy Two-Tone and their memorable phone number, 867-5309, Jenny set the airwaves ablaze. Now, I interviewed lead singer Tommy Heath and guitarist co-writer Jim Keller, who have the complete oral history of this song up next is definitive. As we go into the story of the song, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Go get yourself a new pair of glasses or sunglasses at zenny.com. You can design your own pair there, do a virtual try-on, and you'll pay less than you do a vinyl record. Now here are Tommy and Jim with the story of A675309. I want to kind of do a, a little bit of an oral history of Jenny of A675309. Of course, is number four on the pop charts, number two in Canada. Also hit the rock charts. One of the most memorable songs of the entire 80s and beyond, A675309, Jenny. Co-written with Alex Call, who uh, yeah. he was the lead singer in Clover. Alex stated that he came up with Jenny and the phone number all in one sitting in his backyard, but you were the one that came up with the idea to make the lyric about the girl's phone number being written on a bathroom wall, is what I understand. Tell me about that. My memory is not very good about any of this stuff, but I've talked to Alex about it a bunch. And he, essentially what happened is Alex had this um, and Alex and a couple of friends of mine had these, um, they took these, they had these storage containers out by San Quentin in this like empty lot that they would rent and then put their little studio in. So we would go out there and jam and write. And Alex and I had written a bunch of stuff together. Um, and one day I went out there and Alex had the basis of this whole song all done. And I walked in and I went, what is that? You know, and we started playing it and then I brought the lyrical content in, um, and it was, I mean, when we originally wrote it, I, the lyrics were more uh, R-rated, shall we say. Um, and we kind of weren't taking it that seriously. But then as soon as I brought it into, you know, like, jam it with a band, it was so instantly fun to play that I altered the lyrics so that they were more acceptable, you know, generally. Um, but that track, from the moment I heard it, when I went out to visit Alex that day, it was just clear. And then as soon as you start playing it, for whatever reason, um, it was there was something undeniable about it. Never at no point did I ever think it was going to be a hit single. Um, but when we recorded it, it was just so clear that uh, beyond all the other material, we, other material we had, that it, it was just there was something unique about it. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of wild because to this day, you know, any any bad guitar player can play that song and it still works it's kind of like louis it's kind of like louis there's no such thing as a bad version of that song even the bad ones are good um so it was you know it was kind of like a little magical thing that i was very fortunate enough to be a part of well i know that as i've read about it, as i love to read about the history of songs especially when i was a kid i'd get my anything I'd get my hands on and and there's always the urban legends that go back and forth less so today because we have the internet and people can check I know, it yeah. <laughs> right. back in the day <laughs> 
there were so many cool urban <laughs> legends about how songs came together. And I remember that Alex claimed somewhere in an interview that Jenny and the phone number just kind of came out of the ether. But uh, in an interview you did with People Magazine back in 82, you said there is an actual Jenny and you called her on a dare. Do you remember anything about that? Well, I could tell you what I remember about doing those interviews with Columbia Records in the PR department at the record label. <laughs> Um, the first, I remember, I'll never forget this. The first interview we had with, uh, after that record came out and we were brought this to Columbia and they would bring in, you know, one re interviewer after another at that stage. And the first one came in and the woman who was interviewing me, or maybe it was a man, I don't remember. She said, so is, is there a real Jenny? Where did that come from? I said, no, you know, Alex and I just made it up. There is no real Jenny. And we finished the interview and that person left and the PR person came up to me and she said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> because essentially it was so boring of an answer she said just make something up and i don't care if it's something different every time which was a lesson in you know uh marketing i shall so we say so well i i know several people through the years that have told me that they say that jenny is a real person in fact my producing partner says that he knows her and we were actually going to try to set up an interview with her but I mean, you you wrote the song, so you'd know. Well, there were Je there were subsequent subsequent Jennies. There's always been a lot of stories about if Jenny was a real person or not, and it's funny because well, all three band members have kind of yeah. a different story. You know? Alex Call is the primary writer, and yeah. Jim both claim that they just made her up, but Jenny and I think she's real. But the, it wasn't based on a Jenny. Sorry, this is the boring. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get yelled at by my PR staff. <laughs> that's what's good uh, professor rock we want to we want to tell the difference uh yeah. what's the urban legend truth fact and fiction all that kind of stuff because 40 40 something years later or i guess 40 years later i mean it's it's kind of fun to to talk about yeah. and delve into that they they appeared out of everywhere at the time though there were jennies all over the place yeah in 81 she was running the sound at a place called the club in Carmel. Good sound person. She gave me the phone number to give to Jim. And I was kind of a dickhead back then. I wrote it on the bathroom wall. And when they laughed about it, wrote a song completely different from what the other guys say. But in my reality or in the dimension I travel to most of the time, she's real. Well, you wrote the verses. The lyric sequence I want to ask you about in particular is in verse two, when you say, Jenny, Jenny, you're the, you're the girl for me. Oh, you don't know me, but you make me so happy. I tried to call you before, but I lost my nerve. I tried my imagination, but I was disturbed. My imagination, but I, was disturbed. I was wondered what <laughs> by disturbed. Do you mean freak out by your fantasy or? Uh, I don't want, do I have to go there? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I hate to do this, but you know, the guy's in a bathroom stall. And use your imagination. In the music video, the Jenny character uh, was actually uh, was played by a Playboy centerfold. Yeah, it's uh, Karen Elaine uh, Morton. You got your facts together, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she was like June seventy nine. I don't remember something. You know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. She didn't want to have much to do with us. That was for sure. Tell me about the video, what you remember, because those were the early days of MTV. Well, we had made three or four videos by people who just didn't get it. You know, they follow the song. You can do a better job in your head. Uh, well, making the video, we knew, you know, we had a budget to do it and uh, MTV had started. What's that director's name? It's just a genius. He, they had all worked in a racer head. Not Dave and Lynch, but his crew his guys. and this guy that directed these, they came up with the whole story. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did two videos always. Um, so Which Man Are You is, was done at the same time. Which man are you? Which man are you? Musicians can't really act. We're not actors. And, you know, it's a long, boring day, basically. The window one I was really embarrassed about, but looking back, it's pretty cool. And literally at the airport, we got off the plane, we we're getting our luggage and someone came up and went, oh, there they are, Tommy Tutan, you're the psychiatrist. Yeah, I got it, I got it. And I'm like, what? 
it was like that obvious, just like that, the impact of what that was going to be like. Because, you know, they'd been watching us on television after school. And there I was. And now they saw me in the airport. You know, I led the band on stage, but I didn't talk to anybody. And he was a businessman. So the, we, we played that up in both videos. And he's real suave. And I'm just Midwest, every man kind of guy. I had a good time making it. I never talked to that girl again. I know there are a lot of people who claim they were her, but I, I don't follow that stuff. Yeah, the impact of it was almost immediate for us as soon as that came out and those you saw what happened. Well, and after that, you saw that for a good time call this person scratched on the bathroom wall. It's just so funny how songs, especially in the 80s, I think this was really prevalent where it became part of the lexicon. It became part of the lingo from pop music songs from you guys to My Sharona to a lot of the stuff that came out at that time. Well, I mean, anybody who's been assigned the number 8675309 has been on the other end of just countless prank calls, people asking for Jenny. I know that in 1982, WLS Radio obtained the number from a Chicago woman and received 22,000 calls in like four days. I've never dialed the number. Brown University, if like 20 years later, they get it, and then the dormitory's getting all these prank calls and everything. You know, little old ladies and you know, cafeteria at a school. And you hear the story about Southwest Junior High School. They got 200 calls a day. They had to change that number. Uh, people got rid of their numbers pretty quick, I think. And then all of the different things on like eBay, where they're trying oh, to yeah, they're sell the it, number, yeah. the plumbing company. Yeah, I, you know, it's, I kind of stopped paying attention because there are so many of those things going on. What's the funniest prank that someone's played on you as co-author of the song? Is there anything that you remember over the years? Well, actually, that People magazine article, um, the woman came out on the road with us, and um, it was kind of classic. You know, she'd come out and he'd hang out with us, and she was our best friend. And then she, the whole gist of the article was how Tommy and I fought all the time. And, and I think it painted a pretty positive picture of me and maybe a little less positive picture of Tommy. There were some quotes in there, I don't remember. But it was like, you know, we thought she was going to be nice to all of us or whatever. But she also put my phone number in there. So I got a million phone calls and I had to change my phone number. So that was, <laughs> that, that came back at me then. Well, after you and the band cut the record, what did you think the chances were that it was a hit record? I'm always interested. Did you know it was a hit? You know, look, it was it was it was number five for what I don't know how many weeks. Did I ever think that was going to happen to our funky bar band? No. Um, did I want it to happen? And did I kind of aspire to it? Yeah, totally. You know, we wanted to be huge like everybody else, but did I really think that could happen? No, I didn't. And, you know, it almost didn't. The record came out and it really didn't do that much. Um, but then a couple of radio stations kind of latched onto the song, you know, almost months after the release. And, and then, it, then it exploded and it was, you know, it, it took off. And I remember we were opening for <laughs> Cheap Trick in Pittsburgh. And, oh my God, they were so good. I loved playing with them. And I remember being backstage and our manager coming up to us telling us that it, you know, it was top five. And it was like, whoa, man. You know, um, you know that's, a, that's a pretty cool experience. Well, do you remember the first time you heard it on the radio? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, first time I heard it on the radio was in my apartment. I, I, I say unfortunately because really you want to hear it in the car. Uh, and then... So then after a while, you couldn't get away from it. But um, yeah, I remember literally, I was in you know, my apartment on Clement Street in San Francisco. And, you know, you know uh, like I said, it's a little too similar to the st playing it on your stereo. Um, so the, the, the joy ride is when you're in the car and you hear one of your songs. And I don't care when it is. If it happens today to me, and if I'm in the car, I hear any of my songs on the radio, that's just special. You know, I mean, I think, you know, rock and roll is especially that is, you know, truly are so many of our experiences are, you know, in that kind of setting. Um, 
and it's you know it's still cool it's not like you know i'm sure like classical music is not associated with a car as much but uh certainly rock and roll totally is well like you said i mean there was very little promotional effort behind it but to uh, lit up the phone lines with listener requests when people started playing certain djs and went to number four it actually peaked number four on the billboard hot 100 went to number one on the mainstream rock tracks chart i had thought that jenny was too hillbilly a name to be in a hit song but it <laughs> turned out i was wrong what do you remember about recording the song because i mean it very much what I like about that song is it has a vibe that you talk about the 50s being an influence on you. You can hear a little bit of Rocky Billy in there, but also just very rock and roll, modern rock. You know? Yeah, well, that line in the second verse, they did it, uh, that's surf music right there. I tried my imagination, and your vocal on it too is like. It was, uh, I think the vocal is responsible for all the money actually. It, when they sang it to me, it sounded like a really corny third grade nursery rhyme. I mean, we can inject some rock, bluesy stuff in here. But it's totally original progression and riff. The four chord progression that Call fashioned after the Rolling Stones song, Empty Heart. I'm pretty sure that Alex didn't wasn't thinking of anything when he wrote those chords, because I know how Alex writes and I know how I write. And you pick up a guitar and you start playing something, and, and just something comes out, and either it makes you happy and puts a smile on your face, or you move on and do something else. And I think for the most part, there are very few progressions that haven't been used by some song before. So it's really about a rediscovery, you know. Um, you know, the those same three blues chords, but it's really, and I'd say this as a songwriter, and Alex is a really great songwriter, that when you sit down, it's, it's again, it's rediscovering on your own what those chords mean to you and whatever slightly different um, rhythmic pattern you use, or basically even not that, but just emotionally how they hit you for some, in some way. So it's, it's, un, it's unlikely Alex was listening to anything and copying them. No, and I wasn't saying copying. I know that uh, everybody is inspired by different things. I mean, even Bruce Springsteen, Radio Nowhere. Bruce Springsteen borrowed a, a little bit a couple of years back on radio. <laughs> That's a good story. I sent him a, minute, a letter to his manager saying, Despite what it says on the internet, I am not suing you. He said, Thank you. It's good to hear you're not being sued. Is Radio Nowhere. Is a very similar. You see the vibe. video where they switch back and forth. Well, I know I, I don't know how do you bust Bruce on any on that one. I remember. I mean, I'm a huge Springsteen. Is one of my favorite ever. And I remember the first time I heard Radio Nowhere. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is this is Jenny. This is eight six seven five three zero nine. That's why they say melody and lyrics are the only things that you can claim because yeah. there's only so many chords, right? Yeah, yeah we've, it's all been done. They're just, you know, but I mean, how many, I know this sounds trite, but you know, how many people say, I love you, but every everybody that says it means it and it's theirs to mean. And, and, it's, and you know what, and it's true for them. So, and the same is true with music. You send the same chords, but if somebody is saying something that's true to them, that's all that matters, you know? Three chords and the truth is such a great, line you know that's actually the line that i end all my shows with three chords in the truth is that right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah well no i think to me that's you know as a songwriter uh which is what i it all starts there um you know that's the thing that is so astonishing to me about you know really good songs is that is is how is that possible that somebody can do something so simple and have it just devastate me and in in terms of great songs, uh, it, it's mind boggling every single time it happens. You know, whether it's an old country song or a John Prine song. Hello in there. Or whoever it is, it's like, how is that possible that something that simple can, you know, melt me? And it's the magic 
of it's the magic of music, you know, which, you know, fortunately you can't, you can't fudge that. You can't, you know, art, you can't artificially put that together. You know, you can't factory make it. You, know, you got to believe somebody when they're saying something. And that's all that matters is that you believe what someone is telling you and they're able to put that across. You know? When I'm singing the song, I become the character. Not really a musician, I'm kind of a storyteller. You're an interpreter of song. Yeah. Jenny, Jenny, who can I turn to? I mean, that's just, uh, it's, it's like a vocal that, very punk rock. Tell me about when you recorded it. Were there some things that just kind of came uh, spur of the we moment? Were, uh, if you listen to that album, I'm always trying to find places for Jim to sing. I love the, I got it, I got it. I got it, I got, I got it, it for a good time. And then at the end, when it says, for a good time call, that's so funny because I'm sure that was used before, but that became something in the pop culture vernacular after yes, that so song. Yeah. For a good time call. It's just a phrase, but it's some, some, amount of thought control in that song is unforgettable. Well, even I, the, the number, we don't, yeah. because... What is that, it that makes it memorable to you? 8675309, it's the Nyein. Nyein. I got a lot of grief for that one. The song has been so massive in pop culture and has been covered by a variety of huge artists, big name artists, Green Day, Goo Goo Dolls, Linkin Park, Motley Crue. Everclear. <laughs> Keith Urban. I didn't know. I knew some of those. I didn't know most of those, though. It's probably an honor when somebody covers your song. Oh, I love it. I wish it happened more often. The other thing is how many people have covered it. Foo Fighters. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine, nine. Nirvana. Eight, six, seven, What did you think when you heard some of these? I actually haven't never heard Nirvana's version. I like the Foo Fighters version. Goo Goo Dolls. I like um, the Goo Goo Dolls version. I enjoy. Jenny, you're the girl for me. Oh yeah, sing it. Well, and Arnold Schwarzenegger used the song for <laughs> workout music, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that was probably pretty cool. That was so funny. I still pull that out periodically every few years when someone doesn't know about it. And they're like, what is that? Especially since he's been governor, you know. This exercise is extremely effective for your lats and your upper back. Keith Urban does a good job. He sent me a thank you for that. And then Less Than Jake also did it. Also, you probably knew, what'd you think when they use it in Cheers? Did you ever see that? For a good time called Diane Chambers. <laughs> and then Diane goes in and crosses it out. I uh, remember as a kid seeing that and saying, oh, that's that's Jenny, you know, because my parents watched Cheers. Where everybody knows your name. Parks and Recreation used it too, Parks and Rec, the show. Yeah, we did. Oh. I also called 8675309 a hundred times. Oh, on June 3rd, 2014, the Tampa Bay Devil is Joe Madden. Did you hear about that? No. He filled out his lineup card, slotted everybody in oh, the different holes. Oh, I did holes, see that. And played eight and slotted everybody as 8675309 <laughs> as a tribute to the song. Huh. I thought that was really cool. Well, they all contribute to the myth. So I was arguing with my wife, but Alex actually sold his writer spark after the last jingle. We did that plumbing company jingle. They're all time low folks, but hey. <laughs> I got kids in college and my wife thinks I had to sell mine. It's over, nobody's gonna do it again. But other people think it'll be here 100 no, years from it, now. It, absolutely, there's no question because it's such a memorable song. Looking back on the song now, 35 years later, like you just played it, I just watched you play, it was amazing. It was cool to hear a different version of it and then the crowd singing it with you. What does the song mean to you now when you're playing it to crowds? Well, I only learned to finally play it in time about two years ago. So I have terrible time. I have what my band charitably calls tempo dynamics. And it dawned on me how it goes. I go, Jenny, I got you. 
So I learned to play it right and it sounded wrong. So I had to go back to playing it wrong. Now I can actually play it in time. I learn something about it every day. Thank you for watching. Leave us a comment about this Bottle Lightning classic. What do you remember about this song? Share your memories. What are some other Bottle Lightning songs that you think we ought to cover on this show? Tell us in the comments. To hear the song, click on the YouTube playlist and check out my 80s store below where I've actually handpicked items from the 80s. In the links, you're gonna love it. If you enjoy our content, I would invite you also to become a subscriber. Hit the bell so you never miss out on our daily features. Also make sure to click on our Patreon link for more content and to become a real supporter of this cause of keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe and stay hungry.